Welcome back to your weekly edition of Down to the Wire, again with my NHL analyst, Nolan Thode, where we recap the weekly NHL headlines. Nolan, how are you doing today? I'm not bad. You know, we're coming in, closing in on playoffs, so it's been a long regular season, but I think, you know, everyone's excited for, you know, the next step in the season. I think so as well. And, you know, teams are gearing up for that next step. Uh, I certainly can't wait. Uh, you know, it's, you know, next couple of weeks. And something that actually that I want to talk about, and I actually have it down on my Sunday notes, but since you bring up the point about the playoffs is, you know, do the Canucks and Flames, uh, see, you know, obviously that series is most likely going to be played out because of uh, the TV deal that the NHL has with Sportsnet. So they need the money. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, do, do the rest of the Canadian... Canadian North Division playoffs start on the same time as the Canucks and Flames are playing their series. That's my that's my question that I kind of wrote down. Yeah, it could be interesting. You know, typically all like, you know, they start all the series at the same time in the NHL. But I, 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 a couple of years ago, the NBA, the second round of the NBA playoffs started before the first one, first round even ended. So, you know, maybe in terms of scheduling, just because, you know, those Flames and Canucks games are going to be after, you know, the scheduled, you know, what they wanted the season to end, you know, it could be something that they're looking at just because those games aren't going to mean too much, uh, you know, standings wise. I agree. Uh, you know, and, and it just sucks that because the Canucks, you know, they're COVID ridden. So it sucks that they can't just move on and like, you know, go home and announce, you know, the end of the season early because mm-hmm. the NHL is trying to, uh, you know, recoup most of their money as uh, much as possible. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's been a tough couple of weeks for the Canucks. And now that they're back on the ice, it's just, you know, I, I really feel like hockey is probably the least of their worries. And, you know, I, I feel like they're just ready for the season to end. And, you know, they, they could be making a late push, but, you know, they're going to have to pretty much win out from here on out, you know, if they want to even snap the playoffs. Uh, getting into our Monday notes here, uh, Cole Caulfield, the Habs' top prospect, uh, drafted 15th overall in 2019, was, uh, you know, he made his debut against Calgary. He had power play time. He was actually on the first line. So, you know, a huge uh, debut for the kid. Uh, he had four shots in 15 minutes. However, I thought that Calgary played really good defense. Uh, you know, they kept neutralizing him to the best of, uh, you know, uh, to Cole's abilities. He can really shoot the puck from anywhere. He will shoot it. Uh, he is a, uh, you know, a sniper, essentially. I don't think he's going to pass the puck very often. So, uh, you know, I thought that Calgary did a really good job of keeping Cole to the outside and not getting into the slot. Uh, and actually, Montreal uh, when it goes 3-6-0 and oh against Calgary uh, this season, which is their worst record versus any other Canadian team. So as a Canadians fan, I'm very happy that Montreal will hopefully only play Calgary twice next season. Yeah, you know, for me as an Oilers fan, it's kind of weird that Montreal even had that record just because I feel like Montreal, whenever the Oilers played them, played pretty well. And, you know, Calgary, when the Oilers played them, you know, it was very hit or miss. So, you know, 3-6-0, and oh, it's tough for Montreal. Uh, you know, obviously, I think, you know, they have enough of an edge at this point in the season where Calgary is not going to, you know, get in there for that fourth spot. Uh, but, you know, to go on Cole Caulfield, I think it just showed in this game and, you know, for his first couple games that he's just clearly a naturally born goal scorer. He, it just seems that, you know, every every level of hockey he's played at, whether it be, you know, in the World Juniors, whether it be at Wisconsin, in the AHL or here, you know, it, it just seems that, you know, he, he has a nose for, you know, where the puck's going to be and, you know, how to get it on net and, you know, putting himself in the successful spot. Andrew Shaw announced his retirement after suffering multiple concussions. Uh, He was recommended by concussion doctors to hang up the skates. And, you know, he had a great career. Uh, He was, uh, you know, known for going to the dirty areas. Uh, He, you know, and I think that uh, along with Corey Crawford's uh, retirement that, you know, a lot of Blackhawks are going to be retiring from their dynasty years. And it sucks to see, but it's just the new wave of uh, hockey for the Chicago Blackhawks. No, 100 percent. You're, you're starting to see these names, you know, come and go. And Andrew Shaw, you know, was just a, a central part of that, you know, Blackhawks team, you know, winning those cups. I'm, I'm not sure how many of the f- uh, three cups that he was on. I think at least two of them. I don't think 2010. But, you know, you just need a guy like that. He can provide, you know, a bottom six role and just, you know, be a very solid, you know, kind of grindy kind of guy. But, you know, he also had a little bit of skill and, you know, he, he scored some big goals in those playoff runs. So, yeah, you know, unfortunately for him, but, you know, I think it's the right right decision at this point in his career. It was announced after the Calgary and Montreal game that defenseman Noah Hannafin is out for the rest of the regular season with a shoulder injury. 
Uh, obviously, this is a big loss for Calgary as they are trying to catch Montreal for the final playoff spot. Um, you know, and you obviously don't want to see it. He was playing good, solid minutes, I thought. And I thought that he contributed well to the top four for Calgary. No, 100%. He was, you know, the fifth overall pick in 2015, you know, a loaded draft class. So he probably gets overlooked a little bit. But, you know, he was okay in Carolina, was a part of the Dougie Hamilton trade. And, you know, slowly he's been, you know, seeing his minutes increase each and every season in Calgary. And I think this year was the one where he was, you know, kind of establishing himself as, you know, that true top four defensemen. You know, there, there's a few guys in that lineup that are going to get minutes ahead of him just based on, you know, their experience in Calgary. But, you know, I, I think things were looking up for him. So, you know, a tough injury, but, you know, I'm excited to see how Hannafin, you know, can play for Calgary next season. The NHL TNT agreed to uh, to a deal to replace NBC as the secondary broadcast partner. Uh, ESPN is paying $400 million a year. Turner is paying $225 million a year. It's a seven-year deal. Four of the next Stanley Cups are going to be on ESPN, three on Turner TV. Obviously, that's for the American networks. Uh, you know, this is amazing. Uh, it's great to see that uh, the NHL found their second package. And obviously, uh, you know, NBC wasn't going to pay top dollar to be second fiddle, uh, to be on that B package. So, you know, I think it's going to be great to see Stephen A. Smith talk about hockey. And, you know, there's all these jokes going on Twitter that uh, on Monday when it was announced saying, like, Shaq's going to talk about hockey. And, you know, I, I'm all for it. You know, I think this is going to be a change of scenery that is going to be good for the future. Exactly. I think, you know, there's there's two ways you can look at this, you know, expanding the game. One is a huge thing. And then another part, TNT has just, you know, been a solid broadcasting team in terms of sports for the last couple of years, you know, mainly with the NBA is where they get a lot of their revenue. But, you know, they also have a lot of, you know, March Madness rights. And, you know, they've done a good job with the tournament last couple of seasons. So I think it's just good for the NHL and, you know, getting these long term deals locked up, especially, you know, through a pandemic, I think it's a solid thing just financially and, you know, really solid for the NHL moving forward. Another player that made their debut was Ryan McLeod. Uh, you know, he made his debut for the Oilers. I think at the time he was uh, on the second line center. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, I thought he had a good game playing in the top six for your uh, first NHL game. During that game, Connor McDavid uh, got a hat trick. That was his 10th career hat trick. Uh, the guy continues to impress people and is very, and it's very unfair. It's a cheat code to have him on your team. Uh, something should be done about it, like maybe put weights on his skates or something because it's just not fair. Uh, and Leon Dreisaitl had an accomplishment. He passed Marco Sturm as the all-time German NHL scoring leader. Uh, so, you know, the bar is going to be set very high for uh, future Germans to come. No, exactly. You know, Leon Dreisaitl, not even, you know, 10 years into his career, was only drafted, you know, six or six or seven years ago in 2014. So, you know, a big impact on the game. And I think, you know, hopefully, you know, he has an impact in Germany. We start to see, you know, more German players start to, you know, translate into the NHL. You know, you got a Tim Stutzla. Obviously, he wasn't, you know, inspired by, uh, you know, Leon Dreisaitl, but definitely an idol for him uh, for a couple seasons. And, you know, just expanding the game into these European countries where, we're not used to seeing as many players, I think, is a solid thing. And I must agree with you there. I just want to add on saying, like, you know, I was thinking of Dominic Cahoon as well, who, uh, yeah. you know, the Germans silver medaled in 2018 in the Olympics, and Cahoon was a part of that team. So, uh, you know, hopefully we can see uh, Cahoon and Stutzel and Dreisaitl uh, kind of be role models for young German hockey players. No, 100%. These are, you know, young, exciting players. And I think, you know, a lot to look up to, you know, touching on Connor McDavid, like you said, these cheat code, uh, I think, you know, a couple of weeks ago, had you asked if he was going to score 100 points in 56 games, you know, obviously, it's a nice question to, you know, maybe speculate about, but it didn't seem super realistic. But this past week, you know, he had a couple big games, you know, against Winnipeg. Um, and, you know, it, it's looking more realistic as the day that he could potentially get that 100 points. As for Ryan McLeod in his debut, um, I, I he was playing top six on the weekend. I know that. Um, but in his first game, I think he was third line center. And his wingers were Devin Shore and Josh Archibald. And a lot of Oilers fans were making jokes that, you know, he gets called up to the NHL just to have worse wingers than he did when he was playing in the NHL, obviously, on that stacked Condors team. I, uh, I agree with you there. Uh, you know, as we move along here, uh, the Carolina Hurricanes clinched a playoff spot uh, with 69 points and the Red Wings did get eliminated. Uh, one question that has 
being brought up about, you know, around the NHL is when will Rod the Bod sign his next deal? And, you know, I expect Brendan Moore to sign a contract extension with the Hurricanes, but it came out saying that Brendan Moore wants the training staff, the coach, the, you know, the other coaching staff, like, you know, he wants to make sure that all the other members of the Carolina Hurricanes are locked up for long-term or, you know, they get their contracts up because those are expiring at the end of the season as well. So it's great to see that Rod Brendamore is looking out for everyone and not just him. Yeah, hundred percent, you know, for him to, you know, maybe, maybe he's taking less money than if he were to sign a deal right now, you know, if they, if they figure out all the contracts for the rest of the coaching staff, there's probably a little bit less money for him on the table, but you know, it's what you have to do when you have a team like this. I think, you know, they're just super well built. And I think Ron, Rod Brindamore is a fantastic coach for them, obviously, you know, played in Carolina. So, you know, the city means a lot to him and he wants to bring them back to, you know, success that they had, you know, 15, 20 years ago. PBI Sports is now representing Patrick Waugh as he hopes to get back into the NHL as a coach or a GM. Uh, you know, obviously, one vacancy is uh, one vacancy for both positions, I should add, is the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, you know, players, former players are looking really sweet right now in their respective teams. Joe Sackick, uh, look at Colorado. Bill Guerin, look at Minnesota. Uh, I'm not sure how I would. Uh, make of it if Patrick Wall were to sign with the Habs, but it'd be something interesting to look out for. Yeah, you know, you look at Patrick Wall, and he had a pretty rough ending in Montreal, so it'd be interesting to see him go back there. Um, and also pretty rough of an ending in Colorado. Obviously, they were a very poor team, uh, you know, in his final couple seasons, and they've seemed to really turn it around since his departure. So it'll be interesting to see where he lands, you know, if he is able to get a job back in the league. On May 7th and 8th, Golden Knights fans will get figurines of Flurry's save that ended up firing Mike Mike Babcock. I thought this was actually a nice uh, giveaway promotion that the Vegas Knight, uh, Golden Knights are doing. Uh, you know, kind of highlighting players that have made uh, you know big contributions to their team over the years, making big moments, and I think more teams should do that. No, 100%. You know, you look at the MLB, you know, with bobblehead night, uh, you know, I feel like it's a more common thing to have those sort of promotions. Uh, but, you know, for Flurry, you know, a huge save against the Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, you know, just an iconic, you know, moment in Golden Knights history and their young history, just in terms of, you know, a, a single moment you can look at. So it's nice for those fans to, you know, be able, be able to have a piece of the history, you know, within their own homes when they bring it back. On Tuesday, we learned that Jonas Corposalo is done for the season with a lower body injury. Uh, you know, obviously a big blow to the Columbus Blue Jackets. And uh, I guess, you know, just building on morale victory since they did get officially eliminated from playoff contention. No, 100%. And, you know, it's going to be tough for them to be able to win a lot of games with Corposalo out just because, you know, I feel like he was probably the starter by a little bit of an edge. But it'll be nice to see, you know, Merzlikens probably gets the majority of the starts, you know, down the road, you know, most of the games. Uh, so it, it'll be good to see if he can build on anything and, you know, potentially be hot at the end of the season going into next year. Justin Barron signed his entry-level contract with the Colorado Avalanche. Uh, just another great stud defenseman in their pipeline. A 2020 first-round pick. He had 31 points in 33 games for Halifax. And if I'm a betting man, I would have bet that he would have been over point-per-game pace if the uh, QMJHL would have played a full season. But yeah, uh, you know, Colorado, they have so much depth on the blue line. Like, it's a good problem for Psychic to have to even evaluate maybe a trade. No, 100%. You know, last year in the 2020 draft, Colorado, you know, they, they just have such a deep prospect pool that essentially, you know, they can just take best player available. And I think they did that with Bear. And I think, you know, they, they got him late first round. And, you know, it could be looking like a steal if, if he can turn, you know, into a good solid top four defenseman, which I think he, you know, has the tools to become. It'll be tough to see if he does that in Colorado just because they have such an established blue line already with a lot of young pieces. Uh, but like you said, you know, maybe a potential trade piece if he can work his value up you know just getting something even even better in return for the avalanche speaking of entry-level contracts uh the senator signed robbie yerventi a second round pick in 2020 uh to his entry-level contract uh 25 points in 48 games with ives i think that's how you pronounce it in liga so that's obviously finish it uh, finland's top professional hockey league uh you know great signing here i think uh yerventi is going to fit in well with the senators uh you know a finnish player uh you know and I think that just, uh, you know, with 25 points in 48 games playing with men, uh, you know, I think that's going to really help his development. 
Yeah, I, I remember, you know, around the draft, he was, you know, a late first round guy kind of thing, and he ended up slipping into the second round. I think that Senators might have traded up to get him. I'm not 100% on that. Uh, but, you know, they like their guy, they sign him to a deal. And, you know, it, it's nice when they can get, you know, around, you know, 50 games of experience in the Liga, you know, playing with men, you know, even if they're not NHL players, it's just, you know, a different bit of intensity than playing in junior. And I think, you know, he'll be able to make a, you know, hopeful smooth transition into the NHL. Carolina activated Tevu Teravainen off the injured reserve. Uh, so you put him alongside of Svechnikov, Aho, and Teravainen, and that's one scary and dangerous yeah. line when they are on the ice. And, you know, I, I think it's going to be a hard time containing that trio. No, 100%. You know, you look at Carolina, you know, we mentioned on Monday that they clinched playoffs. They've been such a solid team and, you know, they've been doing it with, you know, a couple people, you know, missing, especially Tavo Teravainen, probably the big one. Uh, and then him, you know, uh, Aho and Svechnikov, I think, you know, they're up there, you know, with the perfection line with, you know, the McKinnon line, just because I think, you know, they all can provide so much on offense and defense. I feel like, you know, it's a very underrated two-way line and, you know, getting Tara Vinen back, it's, it's, it's huge for the Hurricanes. Mackenzie Blackwood made his 100th career start for the New Jersey Devils in his young career. And actually, uh, I think his name might get some uh, recognition for the Olympic roster. Uh, if he continues his growth and his development in the right way, we could very well see him on the Olympic roster next year. And who knows, maybe we'll see him on the world championship roster that is happening later this month. Yeah, Mackenzie Blackwood, you know, already had 100 career starts. He's still so young. Another guy from that, I believe, 2015 class, I think he was drafted in. Uh, you know, he's the future starter for, you know, the New Jersey Devils, and he could potentially be a future top, you know, five goalie in the NHL. I, I feel like, you know, he, his development has been, you know, super good so far. I feel like, you know, he's a confident starting goalie at such a young age already, which is, you know, very uncommon to see. Uh, you know, you obviously have him, Carter Hart, you know, these sort of young guys, you know, making an impact already at such a young age. Uh, but yeah, you know, and like you like you mentioned, he, he could be on Team Canada's roster just because, you know, you never know what they're going to do. And, you know, he, he's just a solid piece. Shane Wright is earning first line center time in the U18s, if you guys have been following along. Uh, you know, he started off his tournament with a bang. Captain yeah. Canada, three goals in his first uh, U18 game as an underager as well. Him and Connor Bedard, the WHL sensational player, uh, first uh, time in WHL history that a player has been granted exceptional status. Uh, you know those two those two guys are ripping it up at the uh, U18s, and you know they're currently set to play in under an hour, 4 p.m. Eastern, as we are recording this. But yeah, Canada's been dominant. Uh, Shane Wright, you know, a complete player. I love his two-way game. Uh, you know, he's been, he literally sniped one shorthanded. Like it was no, none of his business. It was actually really funny. Uh, but yeah, uh, they beat Sweden that night, 12 to one, uh, crazy, uh, you know, skill on that Canada roster. I'm not sure if you've been paying attention, but I have a lot. So that's just, uh, Burlington, Ontario news, uh, team U18, uh, Canada news. If you want to chime in, you can. Yeah, well, no, you look at Shane Wright, and I feel like a lot of people are super excited about him, especially, you know, within the city of Burlington. There's a lot of buzz just because, you know, we're looking at probably the number one pick in the 22, uh, tw yeah, the 2022 draft, uh, you know, just a solid guy. And, you know, living in this area, you know, there's probably zero Kingston Front and Act games on cable. So, you know, getting these U18 games on our TV screens, I feel like it's been a nice refresher and we're actually able to see these prospects play. And, you know, Team Canada, you know, we mentioned talking about Mackenzie Blackwood, you know, talking about the Olympic roster, you know, Canada, it's just seems that no matter what they do, they're always going to, you know, be able to way to develop these, you know, young talent and, you know, they, they dominate, you know, the junior levels and beating Sweden 12-1. Uh, is absolutely crazy because, you know, Sweden's not a terrible hockey country by any means. Tampa Bay Lightning clinched the playoffs for their sixth time in seven seasons. Uh, John Cooper has done an amazing job uh, as being a head coach. And I think around the league, he's one of the longest tenured coaches with uh, their club this season. So, uh, you know, kudos to John Cooper. Julian Breezeball still continuing uh, Stevie Eisenman's uh, kind of team, you know, uh, Eisenman still has his fingerprints all over that team, but Breezeball still continuing it. Uh, Tampa Bay still dominant. I love it. 
No, 100 percent. And, you know, for the sixth time in seven years, the one year that they missed the playoffs, you know, Stamkos had a huge injury and, you know, they were even close to making the playoffs. I think that was potentially the year they traded Ben Bishop as well. And Vasilevsky kind of took over. Uh, you know, Tampa Bay is just such an amazing team built for now, built for the future, you know, just a great organization. You know, you mentioned John Cooper. I remember in 2019 after, you know, the Lightning got swept by Columbus, obviously, you know, it wasn't a good look for them, but people were calling John Cooper potentially to be held accountable for that. And, you know, you give him another year as head coach and, you know, he wins the Stanley Cup and then, you know, another successful year, even with missing Kucherov this year, I think, you know, John Cooper, he has a pretty secure job in Tampa and, you know, they could, you know, look to go back to back this year, hundred percent. The Florida Panthers clinched the playoffs for the first time since 2016. Uh, speaking of coaches, I think John Quenville definitely deserves some uh, coach of the year, uh, Jack Adams votes because, uh, the way he has brought up the dominance in Carter Verhage, uh, Alex Wenberg stepped up as well during Barkov's absence. Huberto and Barkov are, you know, huge contributors to that. Speaking of the goalies, Spencer Knight got the win uh, to clinch the playoffs. And, you know, moving or uh, kind of adding on to my Huberto point, he had four goals in the third period, a five point night. This has been one of the more dominant Florida Panthers rosters in recent history, in my opinion. No, 100%. You know, Florida has not been a successful team for a very long time, you know, in our lifetimes. You know, they made the playoffs winning the division in like 2013. Uh, but other than that, you know, last year they made it into the play-in round. I think, you know, when you're talking about Jack Adams, Quinville has to be there. And, you know, it, it's not even because of the team success generally. But like you mentioned, with guys like Verhege, Duclair, I feel like he's just you know, making the best of his deaf guys and, you know, really getting the best out of him. We even looked to Aaron Ekblad, obviously, you know, injured out for the year, but he was able to, you know, make him look like that first overall pick that, you know, people were excited about in 2014. And, you know, with Spencer Knight as well, another young goalie coming in, it doesn't really matter who's in the net. Bobrovsky has been solid somewhat this season. You know, Drieger has been good so far and, you know, Spencer Knight as well. So the Panthers, you know, have a lot of options going into the playoffs. Adam Bockvist has a broken wrist and is therefore out for the rest of the season. Uh, Coach Jeremy Colleton believes he doesn't require surgery, uh, which is the best solution. Uh, I think if uh, if he were to have surgery, he would be out longer. But uh, hopefully Adam Bockvist uh, recovers for 100% and is ready for the next training camp. Yeah, you know, if you look at him getting surgery and if they're targeting, you know, early October to be the start of next year, I feel like it's going to be tough for him to get you know, get into training camp and be ready for the start of the season. So hopefully surgery is not what has to happen. But for Bokefist, it's a huge blow for the Blackhawks just because, you know, their blue line is a little lackluster. And he was, you know, one of the bright pieces, obviously a top 10 overall pick in uh, 20, 2018. Um, so, you know, a, a tough blow for them. But, you know, I feel like their playoff chances are, you know, slowly depleting. And, you know, especially with this injury, I think, you know, you can pretty much count them out. On Wednesday, it was announced that Gerard Gallant was named head coach for Team Canada at the Men's World Championships. Uh, you know, I think this was a no-brainer. Uh, Roberto Luongo with another uh, smart decision. And it was actually announced today uh, by Bruce Garriock that Drake Batherson and Connor Brown of the Ottawa Senators uh, are interested in playing for Team Canada at the World Championships. So, you know, there's already interest going around Luongo making some calls. I'm really excited to see what this team is like because I feel as though the Olympic team will kind of build off what we will see at the end of this, uh, you know, with the roster at the end of the month with the world championships. Yeah, you know, the world championships, I feel like is a very, you know, underrated tournament. Obviously, the hyped ones are the Olympics, you know, world juniors as well. But the world championships, I've always loved, you know, growing up just because it's, you know, the teams that didn't make the playoffs and, the you know, best players from them sort of just, you know, an all star like tournament. And, you know, as well as that, I feel like there's a lot more integration in terms of, you know, youth on these world championship teams versus the Olympics. Like you mentioned, Drake Batherson potentially getting on the roster. And, you know, as for a head coach, I think Gerard Gallant is just the perfect guy, you know, for that role. And you mentioned that you've been following this. And, you know, one thing that stands out is that with the world championships is that with it going on during the same time as the playoffs, you, you know, if players get eliminated in the first round while the tournament is still ongoing, uh, you can still join the team. Uh, I know that yeah. I know that happens in years past, but now my next question would be is I wonder if they still allow that and, but you have to go through all the COVID protocols. So that might be yeah, exactly. a deterrent for uh, playoff teams and those players. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, like in years past, I remember, you know, I feel like one of the years the Penguins took an early exit and Crosby, you know, jumped and joined the team. I think they probably won won the title that year just because, you know, great players on that team. Uh, but yeah, you know, with the quarantine and stuff like that, it's going to be a lot more complicated than, you know, just a regular season. Uh, but yeah, you know, Canada's going to have a stacked roster no matter what. And, you know, if they get reinforcements from teams losing the playoffs, I'm sure, you know, they'll add them to the roster if they can. Jonathan Drouin took a personal leave of absence from the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, that means that his salary was placed on long-term injury reserve. Uh, you know, hopefully his mental health is okay. Uh, I know by watching the pressers, uh, the media was very admin on asking him, like, uh, you know, how, what was it like having, uh, you know, being on this gold drought, you know, like how, basically, how do you snap it? Because uh, he's been goalless in like his last 31 games or something like that. Something ridiculous. Uh, but, you know, he was just tired of it. So uh, for his mental health, uh, you know, he just had to take a break from it. And sometimes that's just what you need to get back going. Mm -hmm. No, 100 percent. And I feel like, you know, we saw Jonathan Taves do this early in the season. Uh, you know, it's just, you know, more acceptable for players to do these types of things. And I feel like the fans, you know, more than ever are, you know, more understanding of this, you know, a tough season for Drew and like you mentioned, the big goal drought, you know, uh, you know, he had flashes of brilliance like he does always, you know, he'll give you, you know, he'll give you five bad games and then the sixth game, he's going to give you a flash of brilliance that reels you right back in on Drew and, uh, but, you know, unfortunate for him, you know, hopefully he's doing as he, hopefully he's doing okay. And, uh, you know, hopefully he's still a piece for the Habs moving forward in the future. William Carlson scored 10 seconds in, which was the fastest goal in Vegas Golden Knights history. Uh, just another accomplishment just, that uh, Vegas is, uh, you know, kind of making in their young history. Yeah, you know, I picked up Dubnik in fantasy and, you know, seeing the notification 10 seconds in that he got scored on, you know, definitely wasn't definitely wasn't the best feeling. Uh, but yeah, you know, quick goal 10 seconds in for William Carlson. Nice to see it. Brady Kachuk picked up the Gordie Howe hat trick as the Sens beat the Canucks six to three. Uh, I think we'll see more of this uh, I, as Brady Kachuk moves along his early career. Yeah, I think, you know, he's he's a Gordie Howe hat trick, you know, in the making. Just, you know, I feel like he might be able to do that, you know, couple nights a couple nights a year. It's not just a rare thing, you know, Brady Kachuk. He's just he's just such an interesting player because he provides so much on, you know everywhere you know he hits he shoots he can make plays uh and if the senators can really you know develop him the way he, he he is you know shaping up i think he can be a really solid player in this league if he's not already quinton byfield made his debut uh the 2020 second overall pick he had seven points in seven games in the world juniors uh 20 points in 30 ahl games he was second on his team in points second on his team in goals and tied for second on team in assists so uh you know just by that reading off his stats you can tell that he was ready for the nhl and i think he was actually playing second line time so i love to see that these rookies are getting the ice time that they deserve Mm -hmm. He got uh, around 18 minutes, I believe, you know, he had four shots as well, just like Caulfield. And I feel like, you know, he, he seemed pretty solid in his debut. You know, it's, it's not very common that a second overall pick, you know, doesn't make the roster. And especially with the Kings team, you know, he probably could have made the roster, but I feel like, you know, they went with a less traditional route, let him play in the AHL. And I think, you know, it might've been for the best because he's stepping in late season and he looked pretty confident. You know, I watched a bit of that game and, on the power play, he was just kind of, you know, holding the puck, not trying to force any plays, and uh, he looked solid. So, you know, a bright future for the kid. The, this pains me to say uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs clinched a playoff spot, but it was against my favorite team, the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, they won 4-1 that night. Uh, you know, a couple lucky goals, uh, most notably uh, the Austin Matthews goal, I should mention. Uh, that was a disgusting goal. However, I'll say it's lucky because uh, Nick Suzuki made a great defensive read as uh, Nick Foligno tried to make a pass into the middle of the ice. And, you know, uh, the puck hit Suzuki's leg. And next thing you know, it pops up to Austin Matthews. And he does his wonders as he risks it by posting in. That uh, ping still haunts me to this day. Uh, you know, as, um, you know, the Maple Leafs go on and win. And actually that night, the Anaheim Ducks were officially eliminated. So I, I you know what, I'm gearing up for playoffs. Reading off this playoff news has me fired up. That's, that's for sure. 
Yeah, exactly. You know, it, it's looking like Toronto is going to play, you know, Montreal in the first round. And I think, you know, the Habs are going to bring a different level of intensity that we've seen, you know, in the regular season with these two teams matching up. I think, you know, a lot of people are discrediting the Habs chances in the series. You know, last year they beat the Penguins in the play in, uh, you know, and they gave the Flyers a run for their money in the first round. So I think, you know, it, it's a very underrated series. I'm definitely excited for it just because, you know, it seems that the Habs and the Leafs, you know, through our lifetimes have never able been have never been able to line up when they have a good season. It seems like, you know, when the Habs have a good year, the Leafs are at the bottom of the standings and, you know, maybe vice versa. So getting able to see, you know, this huge rivalry in the playoffs is something that I think, you know, all hockey fans should be, you know, ecstatic for. Patrick Marlowe and Gordy Howe become the only players in NHL history to play 1,600 games with one franchise. Uh, you know, whenever you're mentioned in the same sentence as Gordy Howe, you are a true legend. And, you know, this just adds on to Marlowe beating Howe for uh, old time games played. Yeah, exactly. You know, he had the games played record, but not for one team because obviously he went to Toronto and now, you know, he's going to slowly start to eat away at that record as well. You know, Patrick Marlowe, incredible career, incredible longevity. You know, Gordy Howe played into his 50s and, you know, we'll, we'll see how long Patrick Marlowe goes. I, I actually watched the Sharks game the other night and Patrick Marlowe drew a penalty. He had a little bit of burst of speed and I was surprised that to see the legs out of him. You know, I, I wasn't expecting him to be able to, you know, make a play like he did. The 41 year old legend lives on. 100%. Uh, moving on to Thursday's notes here. Carter Hart is out for the rest of the season with a sprained MCL. Uh, you know, Carter Hart set the bar really high for him. And, you know, Flyers fans had really high hopes for him out of the first two seasons. It seems as though everything was going to be okay. But then uh, everything just came back down to earth for Hart, uh, you know, this, uh, this season. He didn't live up to those expectations. And, you know, Philly is now eliminated from playoff contention. So it just sucks to see that, uh, you know, hopefully he can rebound successfully next season because he really did make a name for himself right out of the gate. Yeah, you know, Carter Hart, I feel like he still has a really bright future in this in this league, probably a future, you know, Vesna contender, if not winner. Um, and it just seems, you know, it was a tough season for the Flyers. You know, last year they had a great year, you know, a lot of momentum going into the bubble, you know, made it to the conference finals, obviously didn't, didn't win, but, uh, you know, ex exciting for them. And, uh, you know, Carter Hart, he, he's a big part of their future. Uh, it was a tough year. It happens. Philadelphia seems to have, you know, one good year, one bad year. So, you know, we can, we can expect them to, you know, win the division next year. Uh, but, you know, we'll see what they do with Vigneault. I think, you know, they, they definitely got to keep this core because, you know, they have a solid roster. Just, you know, things weren't going well for them this year. Ryan Miller announced that this is his final season and it looks to be like a future Hall of Famer. Uh, you know, he won the Vesna Trophy in 2010. He was a Hobie Baker Award, in, uh, award winner in 2001. He won the Olympic MVP in 2010 and he was the Olympic best goaltender in the 2010 Olympics. Uh, he has the most NHL wins among American born goalies with 390 and he's played 18 NHL seasons. So, uh, you know, it sucks that he never got a Stanley Cup ring. Uh, and it just goes to show that uh, teams with current cores, current young cores, uh, they can't waste it. You know, we look at Toronto, we look at uh, Edmonton, their core starting to come along. Uh, you know, hopefully Minnesota is building towards that. Vegas, Colorado, right? Uh, you know, it just goes to show that, uh, you know, teams, you know, they have to make more important moves to make sure that their uh, players' careers don't get wasted because, you know, Ryan Miller is one of those NHL greats that got his career wasted since he doesn't have that elusive Stanley Cup ring. Yeah, I feel like, you know, people our age, you know, even especially, you know, the younger generation of hockey fans really don't know how, you know, good Ryan Miller was in this prime. I feel like, you know, obviously I mentioned I live in a Buffalo household. So, you know, I'm more aware of, you know, the impact that he did have. You know, he was on a successful Sabres team, you know, in the late 2000s. Um, and, you, you know, you, you went through his career resume. I think he's a phenomenal goalie, um, you know, was that starter for uh, for the U.S. in that gold medal game obviously led in the golden goal to Sidney Crosby. But, you know, he, he was, you know, probably one of the top goalies in the league at that time. Went to Anaheim. Well, went to Vancouver, uh, you know, brought them to the playoffs one of those years um, and then went to Anaheim and sort of just been slowly on his way to retirement. But, you know, uh, an incredible season. It'll be sad to see him, you know, uh, hang up the pads, you know, once and for all. Draft lottery is set for June 2nd, and Seattle will have the third best odds. Uh, obviously, this comes as news for uh, teams that are not in the playoff uh, race 
or, you know, I've been officially eliminated from playoff contention. I know for me, uh, I was heavily watching uh, last year's draft lottery because of uh, how it was so special. But even before that, uh, with Montreal being out of the playoffs, this is always something that I've been looking forward to. And I'm sure your family household, Nolan, has uh, been looking forward to this for the past 10 years. Yeah, you know, the Sabres, if they get another number one pick to, you know, help Darlene, you know, Eichel went number two and so did Reinhardt. But uh, I think, you know, Seattle's got the third best odds. I feel like this is the year I'm kind of cheering for them to get that number one pick just because, you know, it's not like unfair, you know, an expansion team, you know, say an ex- say if Vegas came into the league and, you know, gets a Connor McDavid or an Austin Matthews right off the bat, obviously they didn't, you know, they came in in 2017, the first overall pick being, you know, Nico Hischier. But, uh, you know, Seattle, you know, give them their number one pick, give them their number one prospect, you know, sort of face of the franchise, you know, to have right off the bat. I'd like to see it 100%. NHL All-Star festivities are coming back in 2022, even with the players going to the Olympics. Uh, You know, I think this has been the first time since 2014 that, you know, this sort of scenario has happened. And if the NHL is going forward with this, could we see, I guess, a more condensed schedule? Because there will be, you know, extended breaks for the All-Star, extended break for the Olympics. Yeah, you know, 82 games is is hard to fit in, you know, as is, you know, these players, you know, expected to do a lot. And, you know, next year with the Olympics and the All-Star game, I think, you know, for players, it's probably tough. But I think fans, you know, just have to be excited. You know, we're just getting, you know, more and more, you know, action. I think, you know, not a lot to complain about. Chicago is allowed attendance, meaning all 24 USA teams are allowed attendance this season. Obviously, uh, here in Canada, we miss fans. I miss uh, flipping on a Habs home game and seeing the Bell Center rocking. Uh, It's weird uh, still having the fan uh, crowd noise injected even this late into the season. I thought uh, that we would see fans in some Canadian uh, arenas, but obviously that's wrong. Um, You know, I thought by playoffs that, uh, you know, Canadian teams would get Uh, fans in the stands obviously that's going to be wrong but I'm glad that we'll see that when I flip on an American game that there will be some sort of fan crowd noise legit fan crowd noise no 100% I think you know looking at the playoffs I saw a meme on my Instagram feed the other day that it's it was a photo and it said playoffs in America and it was you know a rocking packing hockey stadium and it was like playoffs in Canada and it was like these people on a zoom meeting just watching a game Uh, so you know it's going to have an impact. Luckily, the North Division teams are playing each other, you know, for the first two rounds. And, you know, there's going to be no advantage for either team. Uh, but I feel like, you know, the playoffs, you know, there's a lot of excitement leading into it. But, you know, the fans, you know, coming back slowly and in, in, in increasing numbers, I'm sure for the playoffs, the league will allow, you know, a little bit more numbers than we're used to seeing. And it, it's going to be really awesome just to, you know, hear the fans, you know, especially hearing them, you know, not that not that injected crowd noise that, you know, you you have, uh, you know, mentioned that you're not the biggest fan of, you know, throughout the year. The Pens clinched the playoffs and that's 15 straight seasons, which is the longest active streak in pro sports. Uh, And Crosby literally saved the franchise. Uh, I think it's been confirmed that Mm -hmm. the Penguins were on brink of bankruptcy or something. And then they lost and then they won the draft lottery uh, in the 0405 lockout, which got them Sidney Crosby. Uh, And, you know, Crosby and the Penguins have, I think Crosby's played 15 years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, So that means, in theory, that the Penguins have always made the playoffs under Crosby's leadership, which is crazy to think about. Yeah, I think Sidney Crosby is just, you know, such an incredible player. And, you know, this 15 straight playoffs, you know, a lot of the credit goes to him. But, you know, the Penguins have built around him super well as as well. You know, from 2003 to 2005, they got Marc-Andre Fleury first, first overall, you know, Evgeny Malkin second overall and Sidney Crosby first overall. It's not very often that, you know, three years in a row, obviously, you know, they were two number one overall picks and a number two overall pick. But, you know, just three Hall of Famers drafted there. Um, you know, Penguins have just been, you know, really well built and, you know, they didn't really have to worry about it for the first 10 years of Crosby's career. And it seems like these last couple of years, you know, as we've mentioned, you know, in prior episodes, you know, their depth is a little lacking. You know, you, you scratch your head every once in a while looking at the Penguins, you know, roster. But, you know, having guys like Crosby, you know, you're just going to be in a position to win no matter what. The Caps clinched the playoffs uh, despite their loss against Pittsburgh. Uh, that's seven straight seasons for the Capitals. 13th playoff appearance in the last 14 years. So they're almost, uh, you know, onto the same level as Pittsburgh. But man, I, I'm very excited. I'm hoping to see another Pittsburgh and uh, Washington playoff matchup. 
Yeah, I mean, the odds are very likely, you know, they're in the same division. So, you know, their paths are going to have to meet if they both, you know, want to make a run. Um, You know, Capital is just successful as well. And I think when you look at, you know, those two years, you look at the 2004 draft with OV going number one and, you know, 2005 draft with uh, Crosby going number one to Pittsburgh. It just really has helped their franchises and, you know, been so consistent since, you know, those years and really able to, you know, bring success to their franchises. You know, I'm happy that they both have a cup at this point in time and, you know, maybe even, you know, a fourth for Crosby or second for Ovi this season. Jason Spezza passed Maurice Richard for 99th on all time points list with his 100th career point versus the Canucks on Thursday night. Uh, he's actually five back of Shane Doan, uh, who has 972. Uh, so, you know, it's, or sorry. Um, he, yeah, but I think it's five back of Shane Doan. Um, but yeah, uh, Jason Spezza, a huge career. Uh, you know, he was elite with Ottawa. And, yeah, and, you know, I think he's actually turning back the clock uh, this season with Toronto. I'm not sure if you agree with me or not, but I'm going to go out and say that. No, yeah. You know, when he was in Ottawa, he was a skilled forward and then, you know, went to Dallas and was that for a bit. But, you know, slowly started to slow down a little bit. And then, you know, comes to Toronto on a veteran's minimum last year. You know, he just played that, you know, bottom six role, you know, was scratched you know, by Mike Babcock first game of the season. Uh, And then this year, you know, specifically this year, I feel like, like you said, you know, he's turning back the clock. I feel like we're getting a a lot more flashes of vintage Spezza than, you know, we would have gotten last season. And he's actually been a solid player for this Leafs team. And, you know, maybe a part of that's credited to the weaker competition, you know, quote unquote, weaker competition of the North Division. Maybe once they get deeper into the playoffs, Spezza might not have much of an impact. But, you know, as as, as of now, you know, he's doing everything he can for the Leafs. And I think, you know, a lot of Leafs fans are just appreciative of the role that he's bringing. Cole Lind made his NHL debut for the Vancouver Canucks. And I think that he's going to be, uh, you know, some sort of, he's going to have some sort of a role as the Canucks uh, in the Canucks future. And I think we'll see more rookies for the Canucks make their debuts uh, simply because of exhaustion. Uh, You know, I think the players are still recovering from COVID uh, effects, Uh, you know, and I think that it's great to see that Vancouver is opting to play some of their young players. Mm -hmm. No, exactly. You know, they have guys, you know, out for the season and, you know, just not with the team. So Cole Lynn coming in, stepping in, able to, you know, get those minutes. He he plays a similar role to Jake Vertan, and I'm not saying they're the same player, but, you know, just kind of, you know, has, you know, a bit of a power forward game, a nice shot. So, you know, if Cole Lynn starts to get more and more successful, you know, Jake Vertanen might be, you know, on his way out. And, you know, hopefully to Seattle, I, I kind of like the fit. Jake Vertanen, you know, was a former top five overall pick, I think so. I think he went fifth overall in 2014, uh, maybe sixth. But it, it'll be nice to see him, you know, have a chance to succeed with a new Seattle team. Well, speaking of Seattle, on Friday, they officially became the 32nd NHL franchise. And, you know, I, I was watching the NFL draft on Friday. Uh, that first round is extremely long and extremely grueling to get through. If your favorite team drafts 30th, <laughs> uh, you're waiting basically until midnight until they make the pick. Um, but, you know, I just hope that I the think. NHL draft with 32 teams isn't as long as the NFL's first round. Yeah, uh, you know, watching the NFL draft, it kind of came to me in the first round that the NFL, I feel like, you know, even though it's unintentional, it just, it seems like the way that their whole, you know, league runs is kind of like a storybook. You know, the draft, it just seems, you know, like, like such a magical night and, you know, they kind of played off as this huge event. And then, you know, obviously, you know, trying to win the Super Bowl is, you know, the, the final page, you know, final happy ending. Um, but yeah, with the NHL now, you know, matching the NFL's 32 teams, uh, you know, we could see the draft, you know, be stretched out as long as that. You know, I'm not complaining because, you know, I love draft action. But, you know, for you and I as Bills fans, it was definitely different, you know, having to wait all the way till the end of the first round to even see our first prospect. Like, I'm fine with the action uh, because in the NHL, we never see interdivisional trades. And the one I'm mentioning is Dallas trading their first round pick to Minnesota. Uh, Mm -hmm. That was a rival trade. Or to Philly, sorry, to Philly. Philly, Um, My bad. But, like, I'm fine with that action. Like, I love that. The fact is the NHL never sees a lick of that. You know, we're yeah. all hyping up like, okay, this player's going to get traded at draft day. Get your get your headlines ready, uh, you know, hockey journalists, whatever. Get, you know, fans, get ready to buy, you know, X player's new jersey because he's getting drafted, getting traded on draft day. That never mm-hmm. happens. Like, it never, never comes to that, which is so frustrating uh, because there's so much action that could come from it. 
Um, but yeah. yeah, like, you know, I love the trading, but it's just something that we never see in the NHL. Yeah. You know, the NHL, they're always going to hype around the stories. And from, from what I can think, you know, the only first round pick, or you know, the only player, you know, big player that was traded in the first round, you know, Braden Chen was traded to the blues in 2017. That's a notable guy. But other than that, you know, every year there's, you know, who can get traded and the draft just typically ends up, ends up being about, you know, the, the prospects. And I hope uh, that with the NHL scheduling and, you know, something that I should mention was there's only one game on Sunday. However, there's 14 tonight as we record Monday. Uh, what I hope for uh, is that the majority of teams, whether it's half the league or the full league play on Saturday, uh, you know, Saturday was a big game. There were 15 games on. Uh, the only team that didn't play was the Winnipeg Jets. And I'm hoping that changes. Like, I'm hoping that, you know, yeah. the NFL, they set their league standard. All teams are playing Sunday, uh, you know. And I hope the NHL follows, with up, follows it up with, all right, so, you know, half the team's playing on Saturday. And, you know, why not? Screw it. Half the teams are playing Sunday. That would be a great idea, right? Right? Why not? Yeah, I think, you know, definitely I was thinking about that this past week, you know, with Seattle coming in, you know, a night where 16 NHL games are going on. I think, you know, especially if it can be like a Saturday night, it can be big for the league just in terms of, you know, marketing and such, you know, being able to hype up all these games. And, you know, for you and I as, you know, avid fans of this league, I think, you know, just being able to sit back on a couch after a long, hard week and, you know, watch 16, you know, a little bit of action of every 16 games is just going to be, you know, a really great thing to see. Well, moving on to that great thing to see point that you mentioned, the Women's Worlds finally got figured out. Uh, they will be played on August 20th to 31st with it being in Canada. Uh, you know, I think that kind of surprised me to see it being played in Canada due to the uh, cases rising among the country. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Alberta cases are rising. Nova Scotia's cases are rising. I mean, we saw a drop today in Ontario, but I don't think that's going to last very long. I hope it does, but I don't think so. Um, but yeah, I think uh, it's great to see that Canada is again uh, being mentioned in the same conversation as hosting the Women's Worlds. Uh, it's great to see. Great to see. I love that the women's got their uh, tournament. Uh, you know, I think that's very important. Absolutely. You know, they, they were they were well deserved of, of this tournament. And, you know, they had their league for a little bit this year. Obviously, it had to be ended ended short, unfortunately. But I feel like just, you know, expanding the game and having, you know, these opportunities for the women to, you know, be playing in these primetime games, you know, whether it be on the world stage or in their own league, I think, you know, everyone just has to be, you know, in favor of it. And I think it's a great thing, you know, not not only for women, but, you know, for the game of hockey in general. And, you know, I think it's great to try and grow the game, right? Uh, you know, it was uh, on In Conversation, which is the first uh, intermission segment with Ron McClain and whoever he brings on. Uh, he brought in Renee Fassel this past Saturday and they talked about the women's game. And from what I caught, uh, I was actually making a tea upstairs uh, during the first intermission because it's the intermission. I don't really pay attention um, until Saturday headlines. That's an early second intermission. Anyway, what I caught from it was, uh, you know, Rene Fassel said, like, you know, the women's game doesn't bring in, uh, you know, it, like any money. However, it's still important for us to, um, you know, try and grow the game to the best of its abilities so that when it does become on a bigger stage, that way it can bring in money. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. No, 100%. And I feel like, you know, in Canada, we're, we're blessed just because, you know, women's hockey does, you know, get a lot of support, you know, in other countries, maybe it's not as big. So just, you know, seeing seeing women play hockey, I think, you know, is inspiring. And, you know, just, you know, for the for for the next generations, I feel like it, it should be something that, you know, they don't have to worry about it, you know, a tournament getting canceled or not, you know. Vegas submitted a plan for 50% capacity of fans in the stands for remaining home games and for the start of the playoffs. Uh, that was reported out of Justin Emerson. And I think, uh, I think if I followed his tweet correctly, they actually mentioned that Vegas wants to try and get full capacity. So, you know, for those late night games, uh, Vegas and whoever they're playing, maybe it's Colorado, Minnesota, uh, full capacity, fire me up. Like, I'm ready for that. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, for both of us who live in Ontario, you know, there's not a lot of scare in terms of if, if there were to be an outbreak. But uh, yeah, get these fans in the arena. I feel like, you know, playoffs, you know, last year obviously was extreme. It was the bubble. You know, we knew what we were getting when we went into it. But this year, I think, you know, as many fans as you can get into the building, I think is just going to be a good thing for the league. Top goalie prospect for the Oilers, Ilya Konovalov. 
has not opted to sign a contract in the KHL and will be coming over to North America. Uh, obviously, this is going to be the succe- the successor to Mike Smith. Uh, Konovalov had a 48-49 record in three seasons in the KHL with a 930, 912, and 923 save percentage, respectively, over those three seasons. Uh, you know, I think Konovalov is going to be great for the Oilers. There's a lot of hype in Edmonton surrounding him. So I'm, you know, kind of excited to see what he can bring to the Oilers. No, I'm excited as well. And when you look at Mike Smith and Mikko Koskinen, they're a tandem, but, you know, they're both, you know, in the latter latter stages of their career. So, you know, any any young goalies coming up for the Oilers, I think is an exciting thing. And, you know, Konovalov, you know, like you mentioned, his numbers were insane in the KHL. I feel like, you know, with all these Russian goalies coming in, you know, Shesterkin, Sorokin, just, you know, being able to make an impact right away. I feel like, you know, kind of all of get him in, get him playing in North America. And, you know, in, in the coming years, he could be, you know, really helping this Oilers team take that next step. Montreal came back down 3-1 to beat the Winnipeg Jets. And if you've been following all along with the Canadians, uh, their record when they're, when they get scored on first is not good. I, I don't have the rec- I don't have the record off the top of my head. I wish I wrote it down, but I didn't. Um, anyway, you know they came back down three uh, one. Huge performance. Uh, Caulfield was buzzing. He had five, four or five good scoring chances, and one of his shots was off the post. Um, but yeah, you know, like you said, to further your point, there's evidence. He's a pure sniper. He just has a knack for goal scoring. Uh, you know, and Montreal is actually only two points back of third place in the North Division, which is owned by the Jets currently. Like, I, I couldn't believe that. You know, a week ago, we were talking about Montreal hanging on the thread of their playoff lives. And now this week, we're talking about Montreal possibly surpassing the Jets. Yeah, 100%. I, I feel like, you know, late in the season, you know, these games against the division teams like Montreal versus Winnipeg, Montreal versus Edmonton, or Toronto, you know, is giving you playoff implications, you know, it just has a little bit of that energy. And I feel like, you know, being able to complete the comeback, I feel like it's huge for the Montreal Canadiens. It shows, you know, a little bit of flexibility in their roster. And I feel like, you know, like you mentioned, obviously not a great record when they get scored on first, but, you know, you can't really control that too much in the playoffs and you're going to have to win in every single situation. So, you know, really solid win for the Canadians. The legend uh, keeps going on with Yaramir Yager. He is not retiring following his 33rd pro season. Uh, you know, I think he still owns the team he plays for. So that's kind of funny. Uh, and the quote that, uh, you know, has me chuckling is that I believe I still have it in me. Uh, that's Yarmir Yager's quote there. Uh, I might use that for my graduation quote, actually. Just, you know, steal one from the legend. Anyway, uh, yeah, Yarger's not retiring. Uh, you know, he, he's still, uh, I can't believe he's still playing pro hockey. He's like 43, 44 years old. No, absolute legend. I, you're, you're totally I think he's been 50 this year playing pro hockey. So, you know, just incredible for him. You know, second all time in, you know, NHL points. You know, we'll see, you know, if anyone can, you know, make a run for that. But, you know, just a guy who's dedicated so much of his life to the game and just, you know, an incredible, you know, figure, you know, legend of the game, you know, Hall of Famer. And, you know, now he he's having success. I think his team was in like, because in, in Europe, they have like relegation in some of their leagues. And yeah, his yeah. team his team, you know, is getting promoted into the main league. So, you know, next year might be his last year, you know, now that they're in the main league, potentially one final run at it. But, you know, an incredible guy. And, you know, he keeps playing 33 years of pro hockey. is just, you know, incredible. Saturday notes. Uh, let's move on to these. these. This one's a juicy one. Uh, Jason Robertson edges out Kirill Caprizo for rookie of the month in April. Uh, Robertson had 10 assists, 18 points, plus 11 in 17 games. Kaprizov's 11 goals. He had 14 points in last month. Uh, in 15 games, was sixth most goals by a rookie in one month since 1990-91. Uh, you know, it, that's what the counter trophy race is coming down to. I personally am going to edge with Jason Robertson. It's a bold take. Like, I, I kind of know deep down in me, like, Kaprizov's going to win. Like, come on. This season, you know, he set many records, whether it's league records, whether it's wild records. Uh, you know, we haven't seen this dominant of a rookie season. I, I, you know, I want Jason Robertson to win, but I, you know, I'm also no, I know the fact that Kirill Kaprizov is going to win. Yeah, I feel like Kaprizov is still the front runner. I feel like he at midseason had that, you know, you know, in his back pocket. And I feel like we've been seeing Robertson slowly get it, get up these 
these leaderboards and, you know, he's able to win rookie of the month. He's had, you know, an incredible year as well. And I feel like a lot of people are going to make the argument that he should win the Calder just because he's a true rookie versus, you know, uh, Kaprizov being, you know, 23, 24 years old. Uh, but, you know, Robertson, just an incredible season. Uh, and, you know, nice to see him rewarded for that. A huge part of this, you know, Stars team that's able to, you know, keep themselves in the race, even though they're missing, you know, a lot of pieces to that team. Uh, two teams here had their first uh, game in May since uh, dot, dot, dot. So we'll start with the Sabres. Uh, the Buffalo Sabres had their first game in May since 2007. It's been over 10 years since they had a game in May. That is crazy. Uh, and then we'll start, we'll finish off with the second point. Leafs first game in May since the game seven collapse in Boston. Uh, obviously, we all know how that went. 4-1, down 4-1 uh, in 2013. So, yeah, uh, you know, just some interesting facts there that I didn't even know about. Yeah, you know, you're not used to seeing Buffalo play in May. Uh, you know, they're they're usually often by now. Same with the Leafs, but you know, this Leafs team, it's 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 a completely different Leafs team from that one in Boston. Uh, I don't I don't even know if any of the pieces on this current team, you know, would have been on that team. I I, I don't think so. But you know, the Leafs they're going to be getting used to playing hockey in May for you know the next. 10, 15 years, maybe even in June, if they can push for, you know, a deep playoff run. I think, you know, the future is bright in Toronto, uh, for sure. Romanov had his first career fight uh, against Josh Norris. So two rookies going at it, actually. Uh, you know, Romanov dished a pretty big hit to Norris, and he took exception. Uh, they dropped the mitts. Uh, I would give Norris the takedown, the TKO takedown, uh, W there in that fight. But, yeah. Uh, great to see uh, Romanov is kind of channeling his inner Alexei Emelin, a Russian native defenseman that played for Montreal. Yeah, you know, it's nice to see a, you know, rookie get into a fight. And when it's two of them in one, it's just, you know, it's just nice to see. And, you know, with Rom Romanov, it's just, you know, a defenseman potentially, you know, you met, you mentioned Alexei Emelin. It could be, you know, part of his game if he, you know, develops into just being, you know, a great defenseman for them. They're more common to get in fights, but, you know, Josh Norris, it's nice to see that, you know, he didn't just take the hit. He kind of, you know, got up and fought for himself. So it was a good moment all around. The Islanders clinched the uh, playoffs for the third straight season. And I think, um, I think either they're hundred percent under Barry Trotz's regime or they're hundred percent under Lamorello. I'm not too sure. Uh, but anyway, I think they'll be seeing a lot of playoffs uh, with Barzell on the team as well. Yeah, you know, you look at the Islanders team and when Lamorello and, you know, Trotz came in, you know, they didn't really have a ton of talent. You know, they lost John Tavares. So I think I think they brought both Trotz and Lamorello in uh, potentially in the same year just because they were trying to, you know, get Tavares back. I think that was the key part of it. You know, he didn't resign and a lot of fans thought that, you know, that was not a very good thing. But, you know, they've made the playoffs every year since John Tavares has left and they've actually had more success in the playoffs than the Toronto Maple Leafs had, uh, you know, this year could change things. But, you know, just a really solid team, really underrated team, overlooked team. And, you know, they find a way to win hockey games, you know, even if they aren't as talented as other rosters are. Cole Caulfield scored his first NHL goal, a game winner in overtime as he received a Petri dish uh, to, uh, you know, go back to our top cheese where the mama hides the cookies. Uh, and, you know, that goal actually eliminated the Senators from playoff contention uh, the first of many uh, for Cole Caulfield, or I guess we should say goal Caulfield. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, you know, I'm, I was super excited when that happened. Uh, such a great moment for the young stud. Yeah, exactly. You know, an awesome moment, you know, around the league. I feel like uh, it was just, you know, known that Cole Caulfield scored the game winner that night. You know, hockey fans, he couldn't really escape it. You know, seeing it all over your Twitter, Instagram feed, what, whatever it be. But, you know, awesome goal. You know, he, he seemed super ecstatic. You know, as soon as he scored the goal, you, you could just see, you know, his eyes lit up. You know, he's just getting happy. And, you know, it, it, Habs fans just have to be, you know, super excited. You know, I see you sitting there, you know, sitting there smirking. You know, definitely happy about it. But, you know, give him 82 games next year. I don't see why Caulfield can't push for 30 goals. LA Kings made a handshake line for Ryan Miller's potentially last game. But it was actually, I think, uh, an update to this note here. Uh, I think the Anaheim Ducks tweeted out that uh, he's going to get his last game against Minnesota. I'm not sure if that's home or away. However, it was just such a nice uh, act out of respect that the Kings uh, went over uh, to the Ducks side and, you know, gave him a handshake after the news came out saying that he was retiring. 
No, 100%. I feel like they just, yeah, paid credit to, you know, an NHL legend. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I think he makes the Hall of Fame just because the best trophy, you know, he did stuff in the Olympics. Um, but, yeah, you know, even though he wasn't a part of the Kings-Ducks rivalry for long, you know, I feel like the respect is just there, and it was just a nice gesture from the Kings. Mark andre Fleury tied Roberto Luongo for third all-time in uh, NHL goalie wins with 489 uh, I think, you know, my dad did some calculations earlier today and he said that he predicts that, you know, it will only take a season and a half for Flurry to pass uh, Patrick Waugh, who I think has 561 or 591. Um, anyway, something around that number. Uh, but yeah, uh, Marc-Andre Fleury getting into the record books, probably going to the Hall of Fame. I would argue that he would has asserted his spot in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think Marc-Andre Fleury has just probably been one of the most consistent goalies of our lifetimes. Uh, you know, obviously able to do, you know, wonderful things, not only for the Pittsburgh Penguins, but he goes to Vegas. And he, I feel like, he, he probably is the reason that they're, they are the way that they are now. You know, not to say that the roster wasn't amazing in the first year, but I feel like their goaltending, you know, backed by Marc-Andre Fleury was a big part of the reason why they were able to compete. And then, you know, having, comp- having a competitive team, you know, attracted people to, you know, come there. That's why they got a Patch Ready. That's why they got a Mark Stone, you know, and then obviously Robin Leonard now, you know, to pair probably the best goalie tandem in the league. Uh, but, you know, it's an incredible guy, you know, passing Roberto Luongo. And, you know, we'll see where he finishes on that list when, when it's all said and done. On Sunday, uh, some history for you. On this day in 1967, some Leaf fans may remember this as they're still celebrating this cup win today. Uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs uh, beat the Montreal Canadiens for the Stanley Cup. 54 years and counting. Congrats on winning your Stanley Cup when TVs were still black and gray. Yeah, my buddy's dad was born in uh, 1970. So, you know, he was born, you know, three years ago, the Leafs won a cup. So it's exciting. But, you know, he, he's gone his whole lifetime without seeing one. Uh, I feel like, you know, this Leafs team is giving fans a sense of optimism. And, you know, we might see that, you know, streak broken. But, you know, they still haven't won it yet. So until they do, it's 54 years and counting. And, uh, yeah, keep on going. Nashville playoff chances are at 91%. Two months ago, their playoff chances were at 2%. Uh, and a large, large in credit uh, was uh, UC Soros. Uh, his past 20 starts, he's 14, 5, and 1, a 1.83 goals against average, and a 945 save percentage. Uh, you know, I think he will be getting some Vesna trophy votes. No, a thousand percent. I feel like he, he's just, you know, last year, uh, you know, they didn't make the playoffs. Well, they made the play in, um, but, uh, you know, didn't do too much past that. But Soros actually kind of had a little bit of a solid season. Uh, and, you know, this year he's really stepped into that absolute starter role. Uh, you know, Pecorine has been in the backup all year. Um, you know, never really taken that spot away from Saros. And, you know, he, he's a huge part of why Nashville is probably going to end up locking up that fourth spot in their division. Yegor Chinakov signed his entry-level contract beginning this, se- uh, this season. Uh, obviously, this name rings a bell. Uh, all I can remember is Sam Cosentino looking confused on draft night. Uh, all I can remember is Chris Johnston, uh, you know, not knowing who the hell Igor Chinikov was as Yarmo Kekalainen goes completely off the board uh, and picks up this Russian stud. And, you know, I think he's actually going to be a great player for Columbus. Yeah, you know, he, he was just kind of, a, you know, every every single player that got picked in the first round up into that point was, you know, you know a name you had heard of. But, you know, when they came up there and said that, it, it was just, you know, a big shock to everybody watching the draft, kind of like a Kakanyemi moment a little bit. But, you know, not exactly. People kind of were anticipating that. Uh, but Chinikov, you know, hopefully he's able to come in and, you know, provide some, you know, much needed offense for that, you know, Columbus team. As we conclude here, this down to the wire before getting to Pegs' predictions, um, you know, we talked about the NHL's new TV deal. We talked about the Sabres and their, uh, you know, history. Well, uh, you know, as NBC is closing out their TV deal, the Sabres never played a playoff game on NBCSN or NBC when they had the TV package during the 10 years um, that they held the rights. It was on versus that TV channel uh, the last time they played a playoff game. So, uh, hopefully the Sabres don't have to go through another TV package to host a playoff game. No, and yeah, exactly. I, I don't think they will. I feel like playoffs is 
within a couple seasons of reach, I don't necessarily think they make it next year just because, you know, even though they have pieces now, I feel like they're sort of retooling a bit and, you know, they got a lot of young pieces that I feel like need to, you know, have a little more experience before they're able to make a playoff push. But yeah, you know, it's been a while without Buffalo in the playoffs and, you know, once, once they get back there, you know, hopefully they're able to, uh, it, it's just going to be nice to see. Moving on to Pegs' predictions here. We have five games in the NHL on Tuesday night. I uh, first uh, I have the Islanders uh, over the Sabres. I have the Devils beating the Bruins. Uh, that's obviously a uh, upset pick, but you know, the Devils have played the Bruins hard uh, this season. Uh, I have the Penguins over the Flyers, the Hurricanes over the Blackhawks and your Edmonton Oilers over the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, I'll agree with you on the Islanders pick. I'll take them over the Sabres. I'll go with the Bruins over the Devils. Uh, I'll go with the Penguins over the Flyers as well. Um, you know, only five games. Uh, so, you know, not a lot of upsets to go. I'll take the Canes as well, but you know, my one upset pick, I'll go with the Canucks over the Oilers just because, you know, I, I, I don't know, just for some reason, you know, with, with only a couple games left in the regular season, you know, the Oilers are bound to lose one that they probably shouldn't. And I feel like I'll give them, I'll give the Canucks the edge on Tuesday. Well, I'd like to thank again, Nolan Thode, for joining me on another edition of Down to the Wire. It's always a pleasure, Pegs.